DaVinci Resolve 20 has an incredible new way to remove or add a frozen still image, a frame hold, so that it can be distorted over time to composite right back on top of a fabric, something soft like this tent. So today, let's take a look at this brand new vector warp tool in DaVinci Resolve 20's Fusion page to remove a Yakima logo, get all the detail, using Affinity Photo, and then we'll also add a realistic Creative Video Tips logo back on top. I'll show the Affinity Photo round trip, which can make in-painting and content to wear fill incredibly fast and easy. And I'll even sneak in a little bit of the new spline warper that's in the Fusion page. The ProRes footage is up on Cutting Club, and thank you so much to those of you that have joined. It's what makes these free YouTube tutorials possible. Here's the footage I'm working with today. This is the tent, it's Rec. 709. I want to point out before I even open up Fusion, I am using the brand new project setting under the Fusion tab to set my default start frame to 1001. This has to be set before you open up Fusion for it to take an effect. So if you want a frames to match on, on what I'm doing here, set that first, then open up Fusion, and now we can start doing some compositing. Now, like I said, the footage is Rec. 709. However, we want to be compositing and exporting EXRs, which is our still image, in linear because that implies linear so to remove the gamma to make this linear under the media in if you go to the inspector there's a source gamma space area just under auto you can say remove curve and that's going to take off the gamma it puts it in the linear space and then if you actually want to see it properly on your display you do need to come up here in the viewer to turn on your view LUT. I've got my gamut view LUT so that I'm adding sRGB back so I'm seeing it properly but the actual data it's working with is linear um, the next thing I want to point out as I go through here, for some reason, sometimes it, it changes to float 16. We need to be working in float 32 realistically to get really accurate motion vectors, which is how this whole trick works. And so I'm going to add another node after here, shift space called change depth. And that just gives me the opportunity to change my depth to say I want to be using float 32 so that when I go to my next node that is needed for vector warp to work, um, it's working in 32-bit flow. It's just more accurate. Uh, so the node we need to create motion vectors for vector warp is the optical flow. So if you don't have motion vectors, this is what will create them for you. You'll notice under the color view now, we actually have vectors that are being generated by this node. Uh, it'll slow down. It's a processor intensive, uh, you know, thing for sure. It's another way you can add, uh, if you need to add motion blur to stuff. But today we're going to use it to sort of do match moving on, a, on still frames. Uh, the other thing to know about optical flow, there's a couple different modes for it. There's a classic mode, which is the older mode, but it's actually really accurate. Uh, it uses the CPU and then there's advanced. So if you need to do something quickly, use advanced. It'll take, you know, use of your GPU. And then the way the setup works is after the optical flow, because we have motion vectors added, you can hit shift space and add the vector warp tool right after it. And the way it comes when you just first load it, it's basically set up for that green input to take a still image based off of any reference frame. So the thing is that I haven't cleaned up a frame yet, so we're gonna do that here coming up next. Now that we've got everything set up, I'm gonna look for a frame to use as my reference. Maybe I'll use frame 1070 here. And what you want to do is on the vector warp tool, set that to your reference frame. And we need to get this frame out of here because I want to use Affinity Photo, show you how easy it is to in paint this Yakima logo. So to export this still frame, while I'm parked on this frame 1070, I will right click in the viewer. And then you can just say save image and then give it a name. Sure, I'll call it frame 1070. It's linear. I'm just reminding myself that. Dot .exr. You can do other formats, but exr works great because it's actually supported. You can do layers in Affinity and bring those back into Fusion as well. So I'll do frame 1070, save, and then I've got Affinity Photo 2 loaded over here. And I'll just say open it. There's my exr file right there. And right away, you'll notice uh, it did some crazy thing to the color. It's because a lot of times I work in Asus. This is not Asus. So if you take a look under your window, you've got a 32-bit preview window. Anytime you bring something into Affinity that is HDR, which is 32-bit flow, which is this EXR is, you're going to come over here. And for this instance, rather than using the OCIO for ASUS, because it's not, I'm going to change this to my ICC display transform. And so I can see things properly. And you'll notice when we bring this into Affinity, it's brought even all these motion vectors into my layers panel. I don't need those for the cleanup that I'm going to do. So I will just select all those and delete them. And the way to understand how Affinity Photo works with layers 
is basically by just like uh, an extension tag on the end of the file. So I might just call this one plate.rgb. So it's that .rgb basically means I can use those RGB channels in Fusion later on. So for this instance, I just have two layers. I'm gonna do a clean plate of this right above it. So I'll hit uh, Command J, just makes a duplicate of that current layer. And then if I come in here, I'm gonna use Z to zoom in. I'm gonna make a selection around this Yakima and see if I can just use something like the patch tool or in painting to clean it up. So I'm hitting L for lasso, which is just my, my polygonal sort of lasso tool, making a selection around the, the area, double clicking to close that. And then you've got, if you hit J, it takes you to these sort of cleanup tools. There's the healing brush, patch tool, in painting. We could try a different couple of different ways. We'll try in painting first, which you can either just paint like this if you wanted to. And hey, it didn't do too bad, but I kind of want this, this line here to continue. So I'm gonna hit undo. And then there's also, if you take a look, there's a, um, there's the patch tool, which I is one of my favorites um, because I can move this and then sort of line up previous textures uh, like so. And if I click twice, it's taking care of so much of the heavy lifting for me. I might come in further with using the healing brush, which is this guy over here, this icon. And then the way this one works is you option click because there's some areas over here that I'm not too stoked on. So I might option click and then let's make my brush a little bit bigger and just sort of clean those up. And you can see just in a, a second or two, I was able to remove that with getting a lot of that detail of those original folds and, and wrinkles in the fabric. Now this one's not plate.rgb, this one will call, be called uh, cleanup.rgb. So to get this back into Fusion, I'll just hit save and it saves that same EXR with these two layers in it now. I'll close that out, go back over to DaVinci Resolve and to load this in, really the easiest way is just to have your finder open. And you can see I just modified that file right there. Drag that still image in, and it should be pretty good. Now, it, you saw there was a there was a change, but that's because I was not parked on the same frame. So there's my clean plate, and there's my original footage. So to get this vector warping, to get this moving, all you're going to do is plug this directly into that input, that green foreground input, which is going to do a generate warp and map. And you can see, with just a few steps there, I was able to remove and clean that up and it's gonna warp over time. Now, a couple things I might wanna do to this to make it that much better, right? I'm gonna go back to my reference frame and mask this off. Okay, so right now this is doing a merge for us, but sometimes you might wanna be able to do the merge separately so you could regrain it and that sort of stuff later on. So to mask this off, I'm gonna take a look at the original footage. I'm gonna grab a B spline from up here, which is just gonna give me the ability to draw a shape and I will just click and draw around where the logo used to be. And then I can take a look at this and then mask off. So I've got this little patch here. So what's happening is if I change my vector warp now to not merge warp over BG, you'll see this is getting affected and it's getting warped over time. So it's basically doing my match move and it's got all the little intricate like folds that are happening from the original you know, track. So I'll stop that for a moment. Now to get this back over the top of the original footage, really simple to do, just add a merge node. I could even take it from here and then stick that right over the top. And that logo is easily removed. A couple little tweaks you might want to do to this to get a little bit better performance on it. The vector warp tool itself is using this entire frame over here and we don't need it to work on that entire frame. In fact, there's a there's an on-screen control that vector warp is selected. If you drag this X over to the middle and then you can just drag this, this box, this is where all that hard calculation of the warping is taking place. Um, that could definitely speed things up. Just make sure it's covering that patch completely. And then when you take a look at the merge, it should be able to preview, uh, you know, a bit faster than it was before. So we'll take a look at that through the media out. Now, if all you came here for was how to remove something with affinity and bring that frozen plate back in, you're done. But I will point out, if you go back to the edit page real quick, uh, it, we're still in linear, we're still looking really dark. So the last step before you go back to media out is gonna be to add that gamma that in the media one we had removed. So a simple way to do that is to add a gamut node. So shift space, gamut. And with the gamut node, if we take a look at this one, load that in the viewer, 
Um, right now I have it set to remove gamma. I don't want to do that. I want to add gamma back. And what kind of gamma do I need to send it to? I want to be sending a Rec. 709 uh, display. So when I come back over to here and I turn my my you know my effects off and on up here, which is, you can do that with uh, Shift D. Uh, we have no change other than the fact that we had have that one frame that we had tracked and, and done our match moving with the vector warp over time. Now let's take a look at adding a logo onto here. I want to put it on this white bright part over here. And if I get my media pool logo, it's going to be white and it's going to be the wrong resolution. So I want to talk you through how to deal with all this. Uh, essentially what I want to do is I want to get this red color from the tent, put the red into my logo, and then we'll get it tracked and match moved using the vector warp. So the first thing I'll do, I'll grab a background tool from over here. And the background by default is black, and it's also 1920 by 1080. Both of those I don't want. So first thing I'll do, I'll load my reference that I'm going to color sample from, just the original footage. And then with the background tool selected, I've got the color over here. This eyedropper, if I just drag this over here, I can sample an area. Now, right now, you can see mine is set to 11 by 14. It's taking an average of wherever I'm dragging it. If yours, the first time you do this, it's going to be a one by one. So if you hold down command or control, you can click and drag to make that selection larger so that the next time you drag and you have to click and hold to drag all the way across, you'll get an average value, which can be good so that you're not accidentally grabbing like a, a, a sample of noise or something. So there we got our color, but we need these resolutions. I want these to match because this resolution here is... Is 3240 by 670, and this one's 1080. So all I need to do is on the background node is change this so that when I use it as a mask, I can see every single pixel of it. So on the background tab, you can force change image resolutions of generator nodes by don't going to the image tab, auto resolution, and then just punching in whatever you need it to match to. So 3240, and then it's gonna be 670. So now I've got that rectangle size. So if I take this and plug this into the mask of the background, now I've been able to change the color of Creative Video Tips logo really easily. Um, the only thing is for the vector warp tool to work, for this tool down here to work, it needs to match what the actual footage resolution is. So I do need to get this to 1920 by 1080. So an easy way to do that and uh, just get this to fit in initially is going to be to add what's called the letterbox node. The letterbox node is going to also take the media and resolution and it's just going to fit it in there. So this is actually going to be able to be match moved and sized into place. So to position this, we're going to go to our reference frame, which our reference frame on our vector warp was set to frame 1070. If you ever need to change this or work on a different frame, you just hit set frame and it takes the frame that you click right there. If there's ever a time when you feel like your image isn't lining up with how it was in the still frame, it's usually either your set frame wasn't the same as what you painted on, or your resolutions are a mismatch. So anyways, we're working on frame 1070 today, and I wanna stick this over the top. And what I need to actually do, because I've already used up this one vector warp for this cleanup, I'm gonna take a copy of this. So I'm gonna hit Command C, Command V, and this vector warp is going to be used for the, the Creative Video Tips logo. You can see this one is using this region over here for better performance. I had shrunk that region down. On this one instead, I'm going to probably stick the, the patch over here. So just moving that over there and not leaving it to the full frame will just make your computer run a little faster. Um, the background of vector warp needs the optical flow node. So you could just take these the same optical flow node. That's the great thing about nodes. You can just reuse those multiple outputs. So this one's going to be used for that section or for the for the logo, and then what what's going to go into there? Well, the 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 logo is going to go onto there. Um, this is still set to be without merge warp over BG, so I might turn that on temporarily. And I only thing I need to do now is I need to size this into place. So what I might do is use a transform and a spline to sort of fit this over the tent. So after letterbox, I'm hitting XF for the fusion transform tool. And while looking at the, the vector warp temporary composite, I can just use these on-screen widgets to sort of place this up into the, the area that I want this to live. I want to use some area that has like some highlights and shadows so that you can see how the overlay blend mode is going to really sort of sort of sell this you know, over time. And then let's say that's decent enough for our, for our purposes today. Um, the other thing I might do is add the warper tool it has a new spline mode so we can get sort of this curvy shape in here as well. Make sure you're working on the reference frame. I'm going to add shift space tool is called warper. 
So not vector, not to be confused with vector warper, but just the warper tool, which also works great over in the, the color page. This new warper tool has this warp mode called curves in Resolve 20, which is really pretty simple to use. What you'll do is you just click and drag. You get these, these Bezier curves. And as soon as you do that, I don't know how else to release this other than coming back over to the inspector. And I hit open and close twice, and that, that sort of releases it. And then it's basically going to go from this add mode, so you want to go to the warp mode. And once you're on warp mode, any change you do is actually going to warp those pixels and bend those over time. So if I select this edge over here, uh, you can see how I'm able to sort of curve that. And I think something with these Bezier handles is maybe still uh, a work in progress. There we go. I had a hard time grabbing those sometimes. But the idea is you can see how you can kind of curve that if you need to so that we're lining everything up on, on just that reference frame. Just these little tiny imperfections are gonna really help sell the composite uh, when, it, when it's done. So if we take a look and sort of scrub through, you can see uh, things are moving along, but they're a little bit broken up. A um, Couple things happening here. One is we've lost part of it. So I might make sure that my, my region here is large enough to cover that whole thing. And the other thing to pay attention to, the vector warp tool has a smooth UV function. And this is going to sort of save your butt. What this does is it kind of blurs the UV. So if I turn this up, you can see the the letters are not so jaggy, I guess. It's the less jaggy button. Um, so we're looking, we're looking decent there with that. Um, the only thing is I, I want to get the overlay blend mode working here so I can take on the contrast of the underlying fabric. So how we'll do that is I'll come over here. Um, first, I'll, I'll take this vector warp and I'll change this again so it's merge warp over BG is turned off. So that way you can see I'm just basically manipulating and warping the logo only. And I'm going to merge this over the top of our existing cleanup version, okay? So after this one, I'll hit shift space, MRG to merge. And this merge is just going to go right back over the top. Now, I haven't really done anything special here other than the fact that I am going to change my apply mode instead of being normal to what's the one that uses contrast. Here's our contrast section, overlay. Um, the thing is, is when you use overlay to start, it takes on basically a lot of the color of the underlying layers is how overlay blend mode works. So I just want to get the highlights and shadows from this. And so the way I can do that is actually to desaturate the layer that's underneath that. So to do that, I will add a shift space brightness and contrast node, just BC, is it? So the idea here, if I take a look at this, I'm going to take the saturation completely out of this, which is going to give me all this contrast in the fabric so that when I take a look at this, I'm, I'm able to get that and it'll shine right through. And I can modify this to my heart's content as far as changing how much contrast I'm, I'm applying. The only thing is, is I, I made the whole image black and white. Well, the good thing is if you take the look at the output of vector warp and hit A for alpha, we have an alpha channel, so I can mask that section off. So we'll do that. So I'm going to take the output of the vector warp and apply that to the mask of brightness and contrast. So essentially, I'm only desaturating and working on the area where I'm sticking the logo on top. Hope that makes sense. So we've desaturated it and we've restricted it to the area that the logo is going on top. So now we can see it looks nice and shiny, like it was actually printed on the fabric. Um, pretty, pretty cool. If you want to, the nice thing about doing all this here in Fusion rather than the, you know, Affinity Photo for stuff like this, is if I need to come in here and brighten up the the logo, maybe I feel like that was too dark. Super easy to do. Go back to the background node, go to the color tab, and I can come over here to like this value slider, and I can just increase that value so that I feel like, you know. That's sitting where I want it to, and you can see I'm getting all of those highlights are, are coming through just like uh, just like it lives there on the scene. To render it out, I would come to the edit page. I would right click on it. I would say render in place. So here's the before, and then if I turn the new one on, this is the render. This is the after. So we've removed Yakima, we've added creative video tips, and we didn't do any tracking at all. We just made sure we had the optical flow node using the new vector warp in DaVinci Resolve 20. Hey, since you made it to the end, I want to say hi. I'm Chadwick, and if you found this Resolve tutorial helpful, I'm sure you'll like whatever YouTube is suggesting next from the channel. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in the next video.